So good morning everyone. Uh, we're going to look at the cardiovascular examination today. We have a patient here, Reineke, who is a young man who's had palpitations and tiredness for a few days and also a cough. So he's come to the clinic here today for a, an examination. We've already taken his history and I've asked his permission if we could do the examination with the group here to try and have a learning experience. Okay, so I'm going to basically approach the case as if it's in a clinic. Okay, and I'm one of the doctors working in the clinic. Or you guys are medical students working in the clinic or whatever. Alright? So please ask your questions to me about any part of the cardiovascular examination and the concepts that I wanted you to prepare if something isn't clear and speak nice and loudly for the camera. Is that okay? Good morning, sir. Mm -hmm. What is your surname, Renika? Swanapul. Swanapul. I'm Dr. Skarpa Skuma. I'm one of the doctors working here in the clinic. And as, as I know already that you've got you know, maybe a problem going on in your heart and blood vessels, so I'd like to examine your heart and blood vessels. We call it the cardiovascular examination. It would involve me asking you to remove your shirt, suit, shoes and socks, pulling up your jean a little bit that I can look at your legs if there's anything that I want to see there. Having a look, feel, prod around to see if we can try and understand if there's anything that we can pick up there. Is that okay? Perfect. Okay, great. Would you mind taking a seat there? And moving your, um, removing your shirt and your shoes and socks, I'm just going to position the bed appropriately, which must be at 45 degrees. So I'm going lifting up the bed to 45 degrees, which is about there. Okay. And I'm going to wash my hands or clean them appropriately using some hibitane here. Thank you, Reineke. Thanks. You can pop down there. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to start off my examination from looking at, a, at the edge of the bed, a general inspection of the patient, and my impression looking at Reineke is that he looks well to me. He does not look acutely unwell, which is the dispy, sweating, looks, you know, that imminent death look, like when you wake up from the day two flu, and <laughs> sweating profusely and feeling very unwell. So he doesn't look chronically unwell to me, he doesn't look wasted in terms of his muscle bulk um, or in terms of his appearance. I can't see anything around the bed that makes me think that he needs oxygen or some aid to help him to sustain his physiology. And he doesn't look acute on chronically ill. So those are the three type of illness levels. Acuteness, acute, acutely unwell, acute on chronic and chronic. He looks well, so that's the fourth one, the patient looks well. So we, we, we classify that by looking at his face, he looks well perfused around his mouth, he's not blue, he doesn't look short of breath, he looks comfortable at rest. Okay, I will get to the inspection of the chest when I cover that region and when I get to the chest area. So initially I'm going to start with examining the hands, and I start by just feeling the general feeling of the hands, it's nice and warm, it's not overly sweaty, but it's not dry hands. So I would say that's a normal feeling. Looking at the nails, I'm just going to talk about one hand here for a moment, but I'll cover both in the examination. He does not have any evidence of clubbing in his fingers. The distal ends of the fingers are narrower and um, shallower in terms of the distal phalanx than the middle phalanx and all the fingers. There is a nice angle between the nail and the nail bed. There's no widening, as I mentioned, of the distal phalanx. And just looking at the nails in general, it doesn't have that clubbed look on the fingers. There's no evidence of tar staining on his fingers. Um, his capillary refill is nice and quick, less than two seconds, which means he's not very cold in his fingers with weak supply, or he's hypovolemic. That's a good evidence for that. Um, also looking at the fingers, there is no evidence of signs of infective endocarditis, which would be uh, splinter bleeds. And the splinter bleeds are important predominantly because the most common cause for splinter bleeds in the fingernails is trauma, like gardening or manual labor. But if he had a splinter bleed to the proximal end of the fingernail towards the nail bed, that would be more um, suggestive that it could be an internal cause as opposed to a traumatic cause of the, but he has no splinter bleeds. The other signs, if I look at the palms, I can see he's got a traumatic scar here on his hand, probably from the gym uh, or some other activity with the left hand. 
um, and there's no Osler nodes and Janeway lesions, which are very rare signs of infective endocarditis. Osler nodes being tender nodes, Janeway lesions, red papule um, that's non-tender, but I don't think you will ever see it uh, because it's in the post-antibiotic age, so we, should, we, we have, haven't seen one in ages. I've never seen one. Okay, so other things that we look at in the hands as well um, is cyanosis. He's not peripherally cyanosed in his fingers. There's no evidence being bluish. He's not got any tendons and tomata, which is deposits of cholesterol, which is obviously high cholesterol is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. He's got no tendon deposits of um, cholesterol that I can see. Um, is there anything else that I need to investigate in his hands? Yes? No, I have a question. Yes? Doesn't some <coughs> No, remember that if the patient have a, for instance, a cyanotic heart lesion, he can have good capillary refill, but it will be blue blood. It's deoxygenated blood. So if it's poor blood supply, like a very cold fingers, then yes, you can have a phenomenon called Raynaud's where you can have bluish tinge developing in the fingers because of poor circulation, and in that case you will also have diminished capillary refill. Yeah, so it's not absolutely equating those two. Okay, so in terms of inspection of the hands, I do I look at both hands. Remember the patient that does not just have one hand, so the signs are not only here, which happens to be the closest area to me. So remember in your exams to please examine both hands. If the patient has, has two hands, obviously if he doesn't have one, you can't look at it. Okay, so then um, we look also at the palms and look at the redness or paleness of the palm, which is easier in, an, in a light-skinned individual for the redness and the paleness of the skin, of the palm. So a red palm could be indicative of polycythemia or liver failure. And polycythemia is when you get an hypoxic patient, maybe a chronic smoker, who is pushing up his HP to compensate for the hypoxia in the lungs or in the inspired air and they develop an HP typically above 1920, which makes them red. Okay, and also then the pale palm, and specifically the palm accreases um, for anemia. Okay, then we move on to the pulse. And the first thing I feel, I find the radial pulse, and I feel the rhythm. Now, if the rhythm is regular, I count the pulse for 30 seconds, and times it by two. That's what Tally teaches, Tally and O'Connor. However, it would make sense that if it's a regular rhythm, even 10 or 15 seconds would be fine to give you the estimate pulse rate in absolutely a very close ballpark range to the 30 times two. So in this case, I'll take the pulse rate for a quick 10 seconds. So this is 14 and 10 seconds, so times that with 6 is about 84 beats per minute. Okay, so that's in the normal range. Yes, Joanna? I see you holding your hand up like this. Does it make a difference if it's like No, this? no difference. Okay, it's just convenient for me at my length to have it over here. Yeah. If you over here, that's fine. Okay, but in terms of feeling the rhythm or the rate of the pulse, that's fine. What I also do is I evaluate, in a general sense, with this artery, just the feeling of the character and the volume. Now, character is sort of a collective thing for how does the pulse feel, apart from only the rhythm and the rate. So the volume plays a big role, and certain conditions can give you um, a feeling that the character of the pulse is not standard. For instance, if the patient has heart failure, he can have a pulsus alternans, which is a large pulse, small pulse, from a baggy heart. You know, that's a heart failure, that's an example. Or bigeminy or trigeminy, which means every second or every third beat is an extra systolic beat from the ventricle, which if you look at an ECG, looks like a ventricular escape beat, which is a different looking beat from a normal uh, sinus beat. Okay, so those are different characters which will affect uh, the rhythm, which will affect the character of the pulse. Okay, so I get an indication here about the, regu the, the pulse is regular, so I've taken the pulse. If it's irregular, like an atrial fibrillation, where the volume is irregular as well as the rhythm, 
then I would have to take the pulse for a minute to get a good estimate of the pulse rate. But in atrial fibrillation, the rate can vary quite a lot. You get slow AF, which is sort of a control measure, sort of in the range of 80 beats per minute. And then you get fast AF, which is in the 140s to 150s, 60s, which the patient can be compromised in terms of blood pressure and chest pain, become unstable. So for atrial fibrillation, we need to take the pulse longer. Okay, so that's basically what I feel here. If I also feel in terms of the character, it's a very bounding pulse, which means the amplitude of the pulse wave is high. It's a very dynamic pulse. It would lead me to think that maybe this patient is hyperdynamic. So what is a hyperdynamic patient in terms of pulse? It means that the patient has turbulent blood flow in his arterial system. But that's what we mean by a patient is hyperdynamic circulation, this turbulent blood flow. Now there can be a variety of causes leading to be, for the patient to be hyperdynamic in terms of his pulses. It can be idiopathic, which means it's just normal for this individual. I myself sometimes have quite a hyperdynamic pulse. Okay? But there are other pathological conditions that can give rise to a patient having a very hyperdynamic pulse. For instance, very common, no, not very common, but important, is aortic incompetence, the AI. Okay? Thyrotoxicosis, a patient who's got extremely high thyro, uh, thyro, um, thyroid hormone. So thyrotoxic patients, um, thyrotoxicosis, acute severe anemia can cause it, as well as some pre pregnancy. Not all pregnant patients are hyperdynamic, but pregnancy can be a cause of hyperdynamic circulation. Um, so those are a few common causes. And then fever, of course. When a patient has a fever of 40 degrees, they can become quite hyperdynamic. Okay, so what we need to do is, if I suspect, in terms of my feeling of the pulse, that the patient can be hyperdynamic, I want to quantify to see how severe is it. So to do that, I use the water hammer pulse test. And there's two ways to do it. The easiest way that I believe for students is the yes, no method, which means you feel for the radial pulse and you go back on the radial pulse until I can't feel it anymore. And I ensure, and this is where the height is important, that I feel it on the level of the heart, so on the zero degree level. Okay, so now I've gone back from where I can feel it very prominently to where I can't feel it at all, okay, on the zero level. And then I lift it up 90 degrees and I feel, can I feel it again now? And in Reinecke's case, I can, which is odd. <laughs> so I'm going to go back and feel it to see if I can just make it a bit more pronounced. I can feel it. And I can feel it. So in this case, I would classify him as hyperdynamic. The fact that he's got a positive water hammer pulse, which means to me that we have to look for a cause. Maybe he's a bit unwell, he's a bit feverish, he's not feeling well and he's got surgery here in his arm. What's that surgery from? Broken elbow. Broken elbow. That would not probably be... It. Yeah, but that would not affect the, the hyperdynamic situation of the pulse. But I do think that we, as we go through, we need to try and look for a cause potentially for his hyperdynamic circulation. Now, not all patients who are hyperdynamic will have a positive water hammer pulse. This is an extreme sign for severe hyperdynamic circulation classically in aortic incompetence, but you also get it in thyrotoxicosis, anemia, and fever. So, I don't yet know why Reinecke has it, but we'll go through the cardiovascular examination in a moment. So, I don't think you're going to die. Okay. <laughs> right. Is there any questions about hyperdynamic circulation? Happy. Now, what we also need to do is we need to, to compare the if there is a delay between the two radial pulses. That's fine, that's fine. So what I do is I feel for the both radial pulses and feel do they reach my fingers together in terms of the pulse wave coming through. And it does. I, that's the radio-radio delay and I would also do a radio-femoral test to feel if the radial and the femoral pulses are together on the femoral artery here. You keep your two hands quite together. I will come back to this issue about radio, radio, radio femoral delay because you need to interpret that in the context of the blood pressure to be on the lookout for a co-optation of the aortic arch somewhere, which is an obstructive thing that can give you hypertension in one or both of your limbs and in your head. 
and it will lead to a um, delay in your pulse wave going through your body. Okay, but I'll come back to that in a moment. Yes. Like the water and the pulse test. Would you do it on both arms? Just no, you'll just do it on the one. I just explained to you and just showed you now the one where you do it with it. Yes, no. The other way to do it is you put four fingers on the radial pulse and four fingers on the brachial pulse, again in the zero position, and feel the intensity of the pulse in terms of the how hard it hits your fingers. And then you would go up. And here it feels quite the same. So not always easy in medicine to make a decision. Zero degrees, 90 degrees. Mm, maybe. So this one is a bit harder because now I have to judge intensity here of the pulse versus intensity here. And the other one remember, is I can't feel it anymore. Yes, I can feel it anymore. As opposed to yes, no, this is a grading. Yes, Dad. Uh, what's the consequence of a hyperdynamic pulse? The consequence is that it actually um, can just lead us to think about certain conditions that could cause it, but in itself, it, it's probably harmless in an individual. All right? So you get a lot of people walking around who are quite hyperdynamic in their pulse with turbulent blood flow, but it has implications for the clinical examination. If you find a patient that's hyperdynamic, you need to look for a cause, otherwise it could be completely fine in this individual. But certain conditions classically give a very hyperdynamic pulse, like aortic incompetence or thyrotoxicosis or severe fever, for instance. Okay. So that, that's the water hammer pulse. Now we get to the blood pressure. Now the blood pressure is a separate skill which we teach you guys at a different stage. I just want to talk about it quickly in terms of the Korotkov sound which we use to take the blood pressure. In Talon O'Connor, 6th edition on page 54, there's lovely explanation of that. And I just want to highlight a few things about that. The reason when we start taking the blood pressure, we feel for the radial pulse and then we pump up the cuff till it goes away and get a rough estimate of the systolic pressure is because of the auscultatory gap that can occur when you do the, take the blood pressure with your stethoscope. And what happens there is, if you read Tally, is that there can happen in some patients that the sound goes away after systole, then it goes away and comes back just before diastole which will make, if you have, don't know exactly where your systolic pressure is in an estimate wise, that you will think that the systolic and diastolic pressures are very close together and much lower than it actually is. But if you take the radial pulse, pump up the cuff and feel where it goes away, you get an estimate that the systolic pressure is in the range of say 130. And then when you go back now and do the blood pressure formally with your stethoscope, you will know that uh, the systolic pressure needs to be in the ballpark of 130. can't be 80. Okay, so that's where you use the radial pulse, and that's why we teach you to do that part before you go and listen to the to the blood pressure to take it formally in that way. Just about the Korotkov sounds. Korotkov sounds is actually phases of sound. So Korotkov one is when that collapsed and compressed brachial artery from the cuff and you deflate the cuff, just opens, and the systolic pressure can get the blood through that little jet that forms jet hole opening in the artery and causes turbulent blood flow. And that's the first sound you hear, that wow, wow, that blowing sound. And that's also how a brewy sounds. A brewy is always <coughs> in systole and is a systolic brewy sound. That's, it sounds like this wow, wow, wow. If you listen with a Doppler over an artery, that sound the Doppler makes, that's the sound of how a brewy sounds when you listen over a stethoscope over another artery in the body. So that's Korotkov 1. That's the systolic pressure, or very, the closest thing we have to it, and that's 1. So 2 and 3, Korotkov sounds 2 and 3, or phase 2 and 3, is when the sound goes louder and softer as that artery opens as the cuff deflates. Then, Korotkov 4 is when the sound is muffled. So it goes, there's a real dip in the intensity of the sound. That's Korotkov 4, stage 4. And that is where you need to take the diastolic blood pressure in a patient who's hyperdynamic. Because in a hyperdynamic patient with turbulent blood flow at a default level in his body, the sound will not go away, which is Korotkov 5, stage 5. So in patients who, like most of you guys and myself also hopefully, not that it's harmful, um, when your 
when the cuff is completely deflated in blood pressure and the blood flows through the brachial artery, it's laminar flow, which doesn't produce sound. So that's why the sound goes away. You can't hear it anymore. That's where you normally take the diastolic pressure. Karotka 5. So Karotka 5, you can't hear it actually. So it doesn't sound like anything. It's the going away of the sound. It's, that's why I call it phase 5. All right? But you need to be aware that in your aortic incompetent patient, thyrotoxic patient, some pregnant patients, severe fever, patient with severe acute anemia, you need to take the pressure at Karotka 4 because you won't get a 5. Does that make sense? So, if you think about it, another way to, to, to reason <coughs> is this patient hyperdynamic. It's just to take your stethoscope and listen over the brachial artery and hear if you can hear sort of that blowing sound, which will be Karotkov 4, because there is no cuff. I had this incident where I was giving blood and I was a student in my fourth year, and obviously that day quite hyperdynamic, so the nurse took the blood pressure, became very pale when she took the pressure, and realized, went to another colleague and said, this student's pressure is 120 over zero. <laughs> so what actually was, happened was, she went down and missed Karotkov 4, and then was listening till it goes away, but it didn't go away. So the cuff was at zero, finished, but I still had a Karotkov 4 left, and hence the reading of zero. So that's why it's important to be on the lookout if you have a hyperdynamic patient of whatever cause to take the blood pressure appropriately. Are you happy with that? Okay. So when we take the blood pressure, we normally obviously take the blood pressure if it's the first reading in a patient in both arms so that we can compare the readings. They should be in the same ballpark, very close. If this one is 220 over 140 and this one is 130 over 80, something's going on. And that's why you need your delay test of your radial and femoral pulses to try and interpret this difference. Could it be a coarctation? And when I talk later about in my debrief about coarctation and draw the sketch for you, I'll explain that to you in that context. Um, maybe I should do it now. Now they do it. So can the camera just focus here? So there's the aortic arch. Okay? So here's the aortic valve over there. And here does go off your big three arteries from the aortic arch. So the one on the right is the brachiocephalic, yeah? This one is the left common carotid, and this one is the left subclavian artery. That looks like an L as well, but it's a C, okay? And from here you get your, your right subclavian artery, okay? And the right common carotid. Now, here is the ligamentum arteriosum, which is the old ductus arteriosum in the fetus. Normally, if there is a co-optation, it's around this area here in the arch of the aorta. Now, if the, if the, the co-optation is situated here, where will the hypertension be in the patient? Well, the blood is coming through here, in this direction. And the obstruction is here, which is just distal to the origin of the brachiocephalic artery. Which means the, the right side of the head and the right arm will have a hypertensive state. So then you'll have your 220 over 100 or very high blood pressure here. But this arm, which is distal to the obstruction, will have a normal to lowish blood pressure. Because it's distal to the obstruction. That's why you feel, and there will also be a delay in the pulse wave to the right arm, to the left arm. Does that make sense? If the <coughs> obstruction is here, past the second artery, you will get a very similar feel, look in the blood pressure. The right arm and the whole head is hypertensive, which is not a good thing. Okay, you can develop a stroke from it, from that very high pressure, if it stays continuously like that. But the left arm will have a normal blood pressure and the pulse wave will be different from this one to that one. Right and left. Got that? However, if the <coughs> co-optation is over here, you will just register a patient who's maybe young with a very high blood pressure in both arms similarly. <coughs> then you don't know. But luckily, this still to this obstruction is the femoral artery down here. Then you will have a delay between your radial and your femoral. So that will flag that it could be a co-optation. 
as opposed to a just high blood pressure. But any young person, I would say under the age of 35, with very high blood pressure, a co-optation needs to be excluded, at least to be investigated for. And a radio radial is a nice, just quick test next to the bedside to do that. Okay, everyone happy with that? <coughs> Any questions about this? Okay. Can I just say, if the co-optation is actually quite proximal over here, we call that a supravalvular, above the aortic valve, outflow obstruction, which will present very similar in terms of signs like a aortic stenosis. Could have an ejection systolic murmur with uh, left ventricular hypertrophy, although most of the times when there's secondary causes for hypertension, the patient has not yet got target organ failure. But if it's long-standing, you will get similar signs than an aortic stenosis because it's just a supravalvular outflow obstruction of the left ventricle. Okay, so this will give you probably a systolic murmur because it's close to the aortic valve. Remember, the aortic arch goes posterior, so these things is difficult to hear from the front. Okay, so let's get back. That's finishing our blood pressure, which is the next part after the pulses. Okay, then I move up to the face. And I look at the patient's face and we go up to the head. And you will realize that for cardiovascular, respiratory, and gastro examinations, we're going to stick to a similar format. General inspection, start with the hands, move up the arms to the head and neck, down towards the chest, chest, abdomen, legs. That's, we're going to keep to that format to keep it uniform for yourself. But remember, it's about being systematic and thorough in your investigation. You can start at the feet and move to the hands, but I'm teaching it sort of a tally convention. All right. So looking at the head and neck, we go to the eyes, and in the eyes, the thing that we examine for is jaundice, maybe hemolysis, in this case, cardiovascular, anemia of whatever cause, and for polycythemia. That's in the eyes. I'll get to the iris in a moment. How do we examine for anemia? And I think this is important to highlight. Maybe the camera can just focus on this for a moment. Marty Louise. So what I do is I place my thumbs on the cheeks. I do not try and poke in the fingers, the eyes of the patient, okay, and make him scared for coming down like that at him, all right? I come, I sort of come from the bottom quietly, and then I put my fingers here, and I ask, sir, can you maybe look up to the room? And I look in, and I just gently pull down the eyelids and look inside the palpebral conjunctiva and look at the color. If it's very pale, it could be anemia. If it's nice and red, red, then it could be polycythemia. All right. So let me just show you again. Come from the bottom, thumbs on the cheekbones, and then gently pulling down the, the lids to have a look inside the eyes. Ask the patient to look up to the roof to try and move his um, irises away. Then I look inside the eyes, just open your eyes nicely, and look at the, the white sclera bits. If there's jaundice deposits of bilirubin, that's a very good place to look. Probably the best place to look for jaundice is in the eye over the uh, sclera. Then when we get to the iris, we will investigate for an arctus cornealis. What is that? That is, in a young individual, a sign of increased cardiovascular risk, probably because <coughs> of the cholesterol deposits in the peripheral ring of the iris. So, if this is the iris, there, and there's the pupil, if a pale ring develops around the edge, and there's a nice sketch for you in my tutorial as well as in Tally and O'Connor. And this becomes a pale whitish ring at the edge of the iris in a young individual. We call it arctus cornealis, a sign of increased cardiovascular risk. The trouble is that you can get a normal degeneration of the iris in the elderly population, which will look like this, which is just normal deterioration and aging of the iris. And that's called arctus senilis. So if you see that sign in a patient who's 75, it's not as useful because you don't know. Is this just degeneration with no risk factor or is it actually high cholesterol? So the sign logically is more useful in younger individuals, which should not, de the iris should not start deteriorating yet. Okay. So that's arthritis cornealis and senilis. So remember senilis means age, old age. All right. Then we move the nose, normally in an adult, not very useful in terms of cardiovascular examination, but the lips and the mouth and the tongue, very useful. 
So examining the lips, we look for color. Is there any blueness here? No, there isn't. And while I'm on this point, remember in your exams to never say, I'm looking for, I'm looking for, I'm looking for, and then just move on. Then you forget to report your findings. Please, rather use the words, there is no peripheral cyanosis visible in the lips. That indicates to examiners what you are looking for and what you found, which is critical is your findings, because we're interested to see not just can you regurgitate the book on the patient, or actually, what are you picking up from the clinical examination, actually? And that distinguishes nicely between an immature, unprepared student and a mature clinician developing here in front of me. All right? So, peripheral cyanosis in the lips. Then we open the mouth nice and wide, please, sir. Stick out the tongue, and we see a nice pink tongue, which we want to see. If the tongue is bluish, that's a sign of central cyanosis, which is always pathological, and you need to find a cause. Okay? It's highly unlikely that if the patient has central cyanosis, he's not going to also have peripheral cyanosis because it's sort of a severe, so the severity of the cyanosis is severe if it starts being centrally as well. So you'll start with peripherally and then become centrally cyanosed. Okay. And if we look at the, at the palate, which is in the hard palate inside, it's one of the features for malphanoid signs is the high arch palate. Now, how would you think about well, how does an eye arch pattern look? Well, there's a few photos in the books and on Google, but it's essentially if you put your thumb inside on your heart palate and you press it up three centimeters, and you then you look up and you see the heart. If you look in that high arch of the heart and the soft palate, that will be a high arch palate look. Okay. So in the exam, we don't put our fingers in the patient's mouth and feel. We have a look, but that's how it would look if it's pushed up a normal palate. Okay. Then we get to the teeth. Now, not the front teeth, so Mel, but mostly the back teeth. We're looking for the quality or the, the, the state of the health of the dental uh, condition, the teeth. Is there rotting teeth? What is this, the actual condition of his dentition? Now, if the patient has rotting teeth, it could lead to having a bacteremia. And a bacteremia is very dangerous, especially in patients who have damaged endocardium in their heart from previous rheumatic fever, cardiac surgery, or whatever cause. So the endocardium is susceptible to circulating bugs. And then if you have a bacteremia with a susceptible damaged endocardium, it could stick and develop infective endocarditis, which is a very important condition and life-threatening. Right. So poor dentition predisposes you to bacteremia, which predisposes you to infective endocarditis in the context of a patient with a damaged endocardium. So he's got previous rheumatic heart disease, cardiac surgery, or a cardiac abnormality in the heart. So patients who have poor dentition with heart problems normally have need to take antibiotic uh, prophylaxis, <coughs> as well as if they have dental procedures with good dental uh, health, they need to be covered with antibiotics because of the risk of infective endocarditis. Okay, so that's the mouth. Any questions about the head and neck, the head, the face? Yes. Um, do you also check for xanthus motor? Yeah. Heart? Sorry, I forgot about that. Another sign of increased risk is deposits of cholesterol around the eyes, which is similar to the deposits in the tendons, and you get these pouches of cholesterol deposits. Nice pictures in Tally and O'Connor, and that's a sign of high cholesterol and obviously high cardiovascular risk. The most important tendon to look out for for deposits of cholesterol is the Achilles tendon in the heel. It thickens. From a nice one centimeter thickness of the tendon, it thickens to one and a half, two centimeters. And that's where it's normally deposits if it gets deposited in the tendons. So remember to look for that when you get to the feet.